From one generation to another, we've learned about this great castle, a fortress, a palace, a military base. It signified power, majesty, and fear. Built over 400 years ago, Fort Jesus has continued to shape Mombasa's amazing landscape. Even in a city with people from all over the world, everyone knows what this castle looks like. But few people know the incredible stories it burst with. Stories of warfare, treachery, passion, and killings. John Geronimo got time and stabbed the captain and killed him. Hey, I am the Kenyan historian, and today I am on a mission to uncover the secrets hidden in the walls of this defensive castle. For over its 400 year history, Fort Jesus Castle has earned the accolade of being one of the most fought over castles in the history of the continent of Africa. So you see the, um, uh, all the old uh, areas where there were fights and uh, looking out to the port and to protect this area and the trade routes going on here, it's just very um, educational. It's been a scene of historical betrayals and conspiracies as well as some of the most defining battles between the Portuguese and the Arabs. It's been attacked nine times by everyone from Arabs buying and selling ivory to Portuguese sailors connecting to India. It has survived them all and today it still stands towering over the neighboring surrounding and as a national museum bristling with cannons and ancient guns so magnificent. They built this fort in the shape of a human being and uh, towards uh, my back uh, there is uh, the head and uh, there are limbs that are projecting uh, on, 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 the, on the northern side and the, on the southern side and then towards the western side we have the legs one on, the, on the, uh, this side and the other one on the other side from the skies you see this mighty castle looming over the seashore the very granite it stands on is a natural wonder for Jesus sits on top of a castle rock a vast outcrop of a coral rock they, they see the where they have uh, done like a demarcation that is ex exactly where the earth, uh, earth surface begins or the end of the coral rock so that that is a level we are talking about and then a little bit up it was now constructed yeah that is me two three times even three and a half times I think uh, that's the, my size so you can see how, and this is the, now the coral itself, but up there, where it somehow has some uh, flatness, that is the construction. If you look on my ex extreme left hand side over here, you can see that there is this massive coral cliff over here, which is a big solid rock. Nothing has been done, just been chiseled out, out of very old crude tools, and from there, whatever they obtained, he actually collected the white stuff, which is, because this is now limestone, which is calcium, and uh, they had, collected a bit of limestone rock which is now chalk and then added a bit of clay and sand to use it as mortar in between the blocks of coral which had been chiseled out already by the slaves and that's why this one here has been withstood the test of time because the material used here is exactly today what you call the main ingredient of making cement in the world which is coral limestone there's also the concept apart from having the massive strong uh, rock rockish design but also the walls are very thick they're approximately 1.2 meters thick in some areas and also remember, even accessing it from Mosul is not that easy because it's quite high. In some areas, it's around like 56 feet high in average. In some areas, it's around like 59 feet high. So when this gentleman came here, they saw this massive, high, huge cliff overlooking the area or the entrance into the harbor. So they saw this as a very good advantage of trying to, you know, chisel out this particular cliff and making it in blocks of coral for building a fortress right above this particular very strong cliff of it by using the by building it with using the coral blocks themselves. For years. The rock and the structure have remained to be the focal point of the coastal city. It was a perfect defensive positioning for fighters. The thought behind the fort's construction was literally a declaration that the occupants were here to dominate. The castle's strategic importance began with the Portuguese. Over 400 years ago, they say, a Portuguese captain and his legions landed in Mombasa 
and here are the island's great heights. The Portuguese built a monumental structure that still survives hundreds of years on. It called Fort Jesus, a great lighthouse designed to guide vessels to the shore and provide defensive cover. Uh, from this vantage point where I am right now, suppose I was a Portuguese soldier, I could easily monitor enemy ships coming from the horizon of the sea. Like right now, there's a tanker over there, a very long oil tanker, which is actually sailing all the way down, following the main uh, sea channel. It will just go straight down, straight down, then come over here, then stop somewhere right in the middle to wait for the local pilot to come and anchor it in. In any case, those are no reasons. The other reason was just to you know, control the ships which were passing via the front here, heading into the old hub of Mombasa. So everybody was very much interested in, building, in controlling the fort here because all the merchandise and the trade in the early days were entering into this particular creek here, which is called, formerly called the English Channel, also um, coming in and also out. Portuguese sailors were successful cross-channel sailors. And they knew the same thing that the Arabs knew and the Turkish knew. And the local Africans knew that the fastest way across the Indian Ocean from the mainland Europe to Goa in India was through Africa's east coast and that Mombasa was strategic. From Mombasa, it's about 4,358 kilometers to Goa, India. People have lived in the castle since the edge of the slave trade, that is slightly over 400 years ago. It is not very much documented on the side of the Portuguese aspect here, but we know for sure the main conduit of uh, sending out more and export of slaves was much more based in the old port of Mombasa at the area we call the Lemon House. That's where thousands and thousands, close to million slaves were exported to outside world countries, mostly to the Far East and some of them to the uh, part of it to also to, to Europe. Normally they were caught from the interior then they were brought in here for auctionary purposes. The trade was done here, auctionary purposes, but actually even some of them were actually we can say they were coerced into coming here, bring ivory, but in the process, of course, ended up finding themselves inadvertently being put into enslavement and being taken to the tunnel down here. As a lot of them were lashed, some of them were chained, some of them were dis uh, starved of food, they were given very small, uh, tiny rations, and even there were tropical diseases, malaria, yellow fever, some of these particular things are the ones which actually forced them to die. And even a lot of them, supposedly, they did not have enough food on board the dows or the boats, they were even forced to eat their own defecated material. In this particular tunnel, thousands and thousands, close to millions of Africans had passed through this particular tunnel here. And uh, these were particularly slaves which were going to a place of no return and none of them could know even where they're heading to. So the concept is, at the end of this tunnel, once you reach here, it was a point of no return. Because the destination you went, you never knew where you're heading to and your family could no longer see you at any time. The moment they reached in this particular point, that's the time they knew that they were coming to another part of the world and they could see the, the boats right in front of them. And some of these makeshift boats, the dows as they are called, as gigantic as they are and some as minor as they were, they used to transport the communities or these particular slaves from this particular entity here by force all the way to the main slave trading markets mostly the one in East Africa which was in Zanzibar in the early 1800s not forgetting that the point the moment you hit the water here and the slaves most of them had not been accustomed to the concept of, of uh, rather swimming some of them even started drowning here out of fear and even some of them ended up drowning here because of mistreatment by their masters but it was a place of no return. We could call it, it was actually like going down the abyssal deep. In some books has been referred to as the Vasco da Gama well, but to be honest, the history of this well has not been generally been known in details. Uh, it's a well in which case, it's a paradox that next to me there, less than 50 meters away, we've got the ocean, which is very salty indeed. And then down here, this well, which might have been dug by local community, it has got very good fresh water. And this is where the well had been dug and still has water up to date. Since it was dug, it is presumed maybe the early 16th, 15th century. And using the same, same Shaluf system I'm using now, they used to put the water from here. And then they could pour the water right over here. Once this particular trough was filled up with water, then they could use the same water either for washing themselves here around this place 
or sometimes they could also it was closed over there they could get the water straight for putting it on the dow on board the sailors because sailors used to pass here going all the way to the arab world countries for trade and also for who came there and back and this well it is so significant in the sense that it is hardly more than six meters deep and you can imagine the water i've actually taken here is very good brackish water i mean we can also sometimes i can show you by the virtue of it i can even test it it has no problem of uh, of disease nobody's allowed to go inside the well here uh, unless maybe it's a bit dirty which hardly becomes dirty anyway but as you can see the water is very clean it's brackish you can never compare this water test with the water test over there and uh, the funny thing about it is that water was taken from here then the, the slaves were washed here taken up there was a big field whereby they auctioneered by the virtue of the way of the health and the way a body, body, body language was and at the same time also from they could be washed here or sometimes be given been uh, taken aboard straight to the dows all the way to the main slave market in zanzibar to understand the key to fort jesus castle and the old mombasa we have to travel back in time hundreds of years ago that is back to 1498 it is the year portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama arrived in Mombasa. History records that people here were not so welcoming to the Portuguese, so he decided to sail further north to Malindi. He established a base there. But the Portuguese had quickly established how important Mombasa was, and so in 1593, King Philip I of Portugal ordered its capture. Portuguese captain to the coast, Matias Mendes de Vasconcelos, attacked and captured Mombasa and the Tuks fort called Raserani. His goal was to protect the Mombasa harbor now in their position and their trading routes. This place was to be a place or point of, point of call for the exchange of fresh food on water supplies when they're heading towards uh, escapades, their journeys from Europe all the way to India, the main spice market areas, and then on their way back. Uh, that's the one of the main reasons. So it was to control the trade route in spices because in those days spices were as lucrative as of course we have today things of importance like silver, gold, even sometimes you can say high drugs too for the ones who, because it was easy money and it was generally controlled by a very few populace back in Europe. So that was the main reason why the fort was built here. The concept of actually, so it was principally for trade, but the concept of enslavement might have come a bit later. The credit for the massive stone fortress you see here today has to go to Italian architect Giovanni Baptista Cairetto. He designed what is still the centerpiece of Fort Jesus, a great coral wall with several defensive towers protecting one of the most impressive Middle Age keeps ever constructed in Africa. And uh, this part was covering the other part. You know, there would be a soldier there and there would be another soldier up here. Where? Up there. So, no, 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 that was uh, like a sentry uh, uh, watchtower. Eh? So there's a soldier inside. And on this other side, there's also another soldier. So this soldier would cover the other one, and the other one would cover it. So it was like uh, uh, this part covers the other part. Twin. Twin, yes. So it was quite uh, a strategy that anybody that is uh, approaching from the other side, this guy will see. Anybody from this other side, this one will see. So they were covering the whole of, uh, of this area. The carving out of this cliff, if you look at the recif of it, this is only a reef that's been chiseled out. This shows, shows that definitely this must have been actually done by native African labor. The base is the coral rock, which is, uh, of course, uh, coral is a uh, living creature, uh, which is uh, supported by the ocean, the sea, and all that. And then, on top of it, they constructed uh, a wall, a, 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 a parapet wall, which was about three meters uh, uh, wide. And that wall particularly was constructed with a, a mixture of coral rock that was crushed, of course, mixed with some lime and some concrete to form a mortar and to come up with about three, uh, two and a half meters uh, wide. And that is why that particular thickness of a wall could not really be broken down because uh, the old uh, time uh, technique of fighting where they were using cannonballs. So the cannonball would come and uh, impact on the wall but it would not make any impact because the wall itself is quite strong the foundation and even there the, the thickness of the wall and the material that they use because it is coral rock concrete and lime which you know lime comes from the the poles the mangrove poles that are uh, uh, prepared and uh, burnt for quite some time it was the symbol of power and dominance it was a castle but also a military base 
Inside this room was a palatial suite suitable for putting up captains for the Portuguese and sultans for the Omani Arabs. The captain house signified the very first battle between the Portuguese and the Arabs. It was in 1631. It is the year the then Portuguese captain Pedro Leitao de Gamboa lost the fort in what was called Chingulia Revolt. What they did, the, the Arabs, uh, under Joao, uh, he's called, uh, uh, we, we, he has Geronimo, Don Geronimo. He was a, 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 a sultan who was uh, educated by the Portuguese. They had taken him to Goa, but he was coming to revenge the death of, uh, of his father, who was killed by the Portuguese. And so he came through the passage of the arches with the other soldiers silently at night. And he managed to come in and trick the captain because the captain did not see the danger. He knew this is one of the prince or one of the sons of the sultans who they were working with. But he got time now, that is Don Geronimo got time, and stabbed the captain and killed him. And that is the time now all the other soldiers came into the fort and managed to take over the fort. The Arabs will make adjustments to the captain house and called it Omani House. So the Omani House you see today was founded on Captain Pedro's failure to smell danger. A Portuguese expedition was sent from Goa to retake the fort. But after two months of siege, that is between 10th January 1632 to 19th March 1632, they abandoned the enterprise. The Portuguese came, I think, twice. The first time they came and they, they could not manage, they had to go back. They got some uh, uh, addition of uh, reinforcement of soldiers from, uh, from Goa and, uh, of course, Bombay. But still, they could not manage because uh, the Omani Arabs had already taken over and the collaboration of the local uh, uh, Swahili people was quite strong. On 16th May, the Sultan abandoned Mombasa and became a pirate. On 5th of August, 1632, a small Portuguese force under Captain Pedro Rodriguez Botelo who had remained in Zanzibar, reoccupied the fort. This chamber we are in here was primarily used for the sake of uh, making things like keeping ammunition. That was the main armory store. So things like gunpowder, cannonballs could be right found right inside here. And uh, it has got two chambers because sometimes, depending on the dampness and the demand, well, that's the reason as to why. So some, sometimes there was this one could actually be used later and then the front one could be used also earlier on. But there was a get here, it is so anticipated that sometimes uh, it was in front, it was covered out with a bit of rock. So it could easily not be noticed that there was another secret chamber on this other side. Which initially during the time of the Portuguese, this was used uh, for bringing in supplies, I mean, supplies from the sea. We can say provisions from the sea, because the sea is right in front. In 1661, Arabs came back to Mombasa. The Sultan of Oman sacked the island but feared to attack the fort. In 1696, a large Omani Arab expedition turned up in Mombasa and laid siege at the castle. The fort had been constructed and modified to make it difficult for the enemy to attack. These are the bunkers that were used uh, particularly by the Portuguese soldiers but in the beginning they were not bunkers they were just openings or like cave-like uh, spaces which which were used uh, as bunkers to protect them from the bombardment of the other uh, fighters who were on the seaward side and they would hide for instance inside to be able to take cover and see how uh, to go on. These bunkers were facing the walls uh, of, of for Jesus, which are very uh, high, tall, and also uh, smoothened. But this now was significant because, in any case, this moat where we, we can see in front of the of the of the, of the bankers, this moat was used as uh, uh, like a walking uh, parapet or a walking platform. So any soldiers who would come through here, the guys in the bankers will just uh, finish them up before they had any idea of even going up or in case there was any attack that was coming from the landward side towards uh, for Jesus. For example, uh, others would have ideas of even uh, uh, coming up and uh, having some ladders to go up. So these soldiers on the bunkers who are on the ground would be able now to warn the others or even attack the soldiers who are on, on this particular uh, area. No one was able to climb up, to climb over uh, to get into the fort because the height itself 
is quite uh, high and also it is quite flat and smoothened. They use some lime, uh, limestone to be able to make it as smooth as possible so that you are not able to kind of do the climbing. Even today you will see some of the holes coming out because of the weathers and all that but it was quite smooth all round uh, with the, 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 the kind of uh, greyish color that you can see and uh, the orange color. That was uh, a part of, uh, of, of the strategy to be able to protect uh, or to safeguard anybody climbing up or anybody coming down. Or either way, up or coming down. And the Omani Arabs knew that. And so they developed a strategy that would starve the Portuguese of food and weapons. The strategy relied on blocking the main entry, but more so the passage of the archers. The passage of the archers was used to receive deliveries, both human or supplies, by boat. They had some information when uh, some of uh, the stocks or some of the, 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 the of course, the food stuff that was inside uh, ran out. They had to send some of the young kids, some of uh, the loyal uh, women who were working for them, and of course, those were local people. So they, got, they gathered some information from these people, which also informed them of the numbers inside, of uh, the, how strength, or the strength of the soldiers inside, and that is how they managed to come in through that particular uh, information they got. From 13th March 1696, the fort was under siege. By that time, it was having a garrison of 50 to 70 Portuguese soldiers and several hundred loyal coast Arabs. The fort was relieved in December 1696 by a Portuguese expedition. But in the following months, a plague killed all the Portuguese in the garrison and by December 1698, the defense of the fort was in the hands of Sheikh Daud of Faza with 16 members of his family, eight African men and 50 African women. And they sank a very important Portuguese ship and uh, by sinking it, these are the remains of course which were salvaged and found out way back in 1967. You can see some of these uh, plates in here, there are also some of these door handles, there are spoons in here found. Also, that is the artist's impression of the diver, the way they went under and found the, the remains of the, yeah. of the ship down and the sea. All no, it was in front of the fort, yeah, in front of the fort. And uh, we also have these plates for food. You know, some of these were the spoons, door handles. We do have also like hourglass for measuring the time they were coming over. Some of the smoking pipes, some of the pulleys for pulling up the masts when they were sailing coming over through through the caravels or the Portuguese ships with many sails. These are some of the, you know, the bowls which are used normally for serving soup. These ones actually were some of the buckles for belts. These are some of the buckles normally used for, for the rucksacks or their bags around. The big one was normally used for keeping either fresh water or sometimes, uh, mostly fresh water. But the miniature one there was used for keeping uh, either grains or sometimes maize flour or wheat flour. And those tiny ones are used either for keeping, preserving of uh, f f cooking oil or sometimes even medicine. There's also the guardian angel. And you know, this ship must have been an authentic Portuguese ship because if you look at those particular cannons over there, they've got the coat of arms still used in Portugal today. So this is an authentic thing which you know about the history. It was sunk in 1698 and discovered late in 1900 and around 6768, like 400 years under the sea. In the morning of 13th December 1698, the Omani Arabs did the decisive attack and took the fort. By the time a Portuguese relief fleet was arriving in Mombasa, it was too late. Fort Jesus Castle was the largest and most strategically important African fortress for the Portuguese and the Arabs. The Omani maintained control of Fort Jesus for most of the next 200 years with interludes for mutiny brief Portuguese occupation and the five-year rebellion and independence by Omani governor. From 1837 to 1895, Fort Jesus housed British troops. The British, of course, when they came and wanted to do their colonial uh, rule, came through this. And even Fort Jesus was one of the administrative centers of the British, where the consul uh, was even staying and, and uh, doing his, uh, his work. The treasury square that is just next to us was connected to the old port by a rail, railway line that would, call, would carry luggages to the treasury square. Yes, like trams that would be pushed by, uh, of course, uh, laborers or Africans. And some of them, just like uh, nowadays you have the trams, eh? but they were made of uh, wooden pieces, but also with, which had uh, some wheels that would go through uh, the smaller rail, rail, railway lines. 
and they would be pushed. There are two types. There are types that were for luggages and there are types for passengers. So passengers would sit and of course they would pay for that particular service to be pushed to wherever they were going. Mombasa was officially given to the British in 1895 by the Sultan of Zanzibar, whereupon the official British protectorate of Kenya was declared and Mombasa its capital. Housed outside Fort Jesus is a Pegasus gun, one of the four guns that were salvaged from HMS Pegasus, a 2,000-ton British cruiser that was sunk by a German cruiser, Coinbag, while undergoing boiler repair at a Zanzibar harbor. It was later mounted on wheels and used as coastal defense batteries in Zanzibar and Mombasa. Besides it is the Kornsberg gun, which is one of the 10 guns that made up the armament of the German cruiser SMS Kornsberg, built in 1907 and sunk in Rufiji River by the British Navy. The ship was used by Germans during the East Africa campaign in World War I. The gun was dismounted from the ship by the British who took it as a trophy. This is the Kenyan historian.